Hello health champions. Isn't it amazing that billions of people are affected by obesity and being overweight and yet there is no other species on the planet that has any trouble in the wild to maintain an ideal weight. It seems so basic and yet despite an endless stream of advice, the problem just keeps getting worse. So today I want to take on some of the biggest misconceptions about the types of food we eat so that after today's video there will be no doubt in your mind about the basic mechanisms of losing weight and burning fat. The development of obesity has been explosive to say the least. In the 1800s it was virtually unknown. A hundred years later we had started getting some sugar and processed foods but it wasn't a staple yet. By 1960 it was a staple and we saw an explosive increase and every year, every decade we saw a dramatic increase. Then it was getting so bad that in 1980 we started getting our first example of expert advice. So the USDA published their guidelines, the first edition, and they felt that we needed some more advice so every five years they have published the guidelines again and again but they haven't really changed much and they don't appear to have helped much either. So before the guidelines it was pretty bad. We were sort of on a pretty steep increase but there's nothing compared to how it's been looking after the guidelines. Usually the attitude toward people with obesity and overweight is that they're guilty as charged that the only problem is that they're taking in more calories than they're burning and they eat too much, they don't exercise enough. And as if that wasn't enough, we really have to rub in the guilt and refer to the seven deadly sins and two of those are gluttony which means that you have no self-control. You eat for pleasure and you're hedonistic about it. And the solution would be temperance, which is another way of saying you just need to exercise some moderation and restraint. And the next sin often referred to is sloth and laziness. That if you just didn't sit around, if you showed some diligence, if you had some determination and effort, then surely you could solve this problem and just eat less and exercise more. But what if it isn't that simple? What if this advice is flawed? Or what if it's even completely wrong? What if we're blaming the wrong person? That maybe the advice is so wrong that we should turn it around and put the advice on trial. So let's take the advice to court and see how it holds up. The guidelines that everyone agrees on for the most part says to maintain an ideal weight. Now why didn't I think of that? Eat a variety of foods, avoid fat and cholesterol, especially saturated fats, and you should increase starch and fiber. You should reduce processed added sugar to less than 10% of calories which is about 50 grams a day. You should reduce sodium and you should drink alcohol in moderation. So that was published in 1980 and after nine editions they pretty much just check the same boxes. They change a few words here and there to earn their salaries but nothing's really changed. We're going to take a look at some of the details, but the basic message is still that you want to control your weight by eating less calories, burning more calories, and eating a healthy diet. But the question which we're also going to talk about is what is a healthy diet? That seems to be the problem that no one can agree on. Now, when we go to trial, and especially if there's disagreement, we need a law book. And the best reference for how the human body works is called Guyton and Hall Textbook of Medical Physiology. It's been the standard since 1956. So every reputable institution of learning when it comes to health has been referring to this book or a few very similar ones to teach their student how the body works about human physiology. 
Arthur C. Guyton is the legend. He wrote the first eight editions all by himself. And then they started adding staff and John Hall co-wrote edition 9 and 10. And then Guyton died in a car accident. So from then on, it was written without him. Today, they are up to the 14th edition. And this is a pretty hefty volume. It's 1152 pages. And I'm not kidding when I'm saying that there was a lot of groaning and complaining in school when people had to read this. Me, however, I thought it was the best book I ever came across because it explained all the things I wanted to know. So I read this book cover to cover and I read most of it several times because I really wanted to know. Today it's been published in 15 different languages. But what I'm curious about is basically how does this book, the principles that they discuss, how does that compare to the expert advice about health and about losing weight? In other words, does it look like the experts have actually read the book? And the experts I'll refer to are going to be the USDA and the Mayo Clinic. Not because I want to pick on them or analyze them specifically, but because they publish a lot and they represent the general consensus. So when I went to each of these, the American Medical Association Physicians Committee and the Dietetics Association and the American Diabetes Association, Johns Hopkins, Harvard Health, they all agreed on these pretty much to a T. 98% they all said the same thing. And that also includes the US News and World Report and the experts there who every year compiles a list and votes on the best diets for health and weight loss and blood pressure and so forth. And through the expert advice, the common thread is about calories. But is a calorie a calorie? Well, Mayo Clinic says that obesity occurs when you take in more calories than you burn. Your body then stores these excess calories as fat. Okay, that sounds reasonable, that makes sense. But what does Guyton say about this? He says, all the excess carbohydrates that cannot be stored as glycogen are converted to fat under the stimulus of insulin and then stored as fat. Isn't that interesting that the general discussion is typically about calories, but Guyton doesn't mention calories at all. He talks about carbohydrates and he talks about carbohydrates getting converted to fat under the stimulus of insulin and then insulin stores these as fat. It's quite a different picture and it makes sense because we have receptors, we have hormones, we have a whole metabolic machinery to deal with carbohydrates and glycogen and fat and insulin. We have no receptors for calories. And I'm gonna quickly go through some of the mechanisms of insulin and I'm not gonna read you the whole thing but I'll let you go back and refer to that. But in summary, when it comes to insulin and storage, the law book, Guyton says that insulin has a huge impact on the storage in the body. And whenever we eat a high carb diet, a high carb meal, then there is a rapid insulin spike. They say that insulin promotes the conversion of carbs into fat and then these carbohydrates turning to fat get stored in the fat tissue. So that's the first lesson that if you have too much fat on your body it was insulin that stored it. We're always told to eat less, exercise more. But when it comes to muscles and exercise we typically also hear that glucose and carbohydrate is the preferred fuel for exercise. But Guyton says that muscles use fat for fuel most of the time. That's their default is to use fat. And the only exception to that rule is when we exercise, when we have a moderate to high intensity exercise, 
then the fat isn't enough anymore and now the muscles become more insulin sensitive meaning we don't have to have a lot of insulin but the work by the muscles themselves make the muscles more insulin sensitive so they can start using up more glucose. The other circumstance when the muscles stop using fat primarily is when we have high carb meals. Why? Because high carb meals create big spikes in insulin. That insulin is going to quickly push a lot of glucose into the muscle. So now the muscle shifts from fat to glucose metabolism. So if we want to lose weight, we want to burn fat, obviously. But Whenever we eat high carbohydrate, then that carbohydrate prevents fat burning. So the more carbs you eat, the higher your insulin is, the less fat burning is going to take place during exercise. And then you're being called lazy or slothful because you don't exercise enough. But the reason is you're not burning enough fat is because you're eating too many carbs and your insulin is too high. That prevents the fat burning during exercise. And even though insulin primarily acts on glucose, it has tremendous impact on fat. So whenever insulin is high, it increases the use of carbohydrates and automatically decreases the burning and the usage of fat. So in other words, insulin is fat sparing. That doesn't seem like a good thing if you're trying to lose weight and burn fat, right? The second mechanism is that insulin also promotes lipogenesis. That means making fat. And it especially does this if we have had a high carb meal because now not only do we have the insulin to push the enzymes toward fat building, but we have a lot of substrate, a lot of building materials to turn into fat. And the third way insulin affects fat is that insulin turns off lipase and lipase is an enzyme that breaks down fat, but insulin turns it off. So in summary, Guyton says that all aspects of fat burning are stopped or prevented or reduced by insulin. All aspects of fat burning. But the effects of insulin go even further and they also affect hunger. How do they do that? Well, insulin reduces, it inhibits, it blocks an enzyme in the liver that is supposed to turn glycogen into glucose. So you eat carbohydrate, you store it as much as you can in the form of glycogen, but you plan to use that glycogen and break it down into glucose at some later point. However, when insulin is high, you can't do that very well. As a result, when insulin is high, there is less fuel available from carbohydrate. And then we said on the previous slide that insulin also turns off lipase, which breaks down fat. So now we have a double whammy. We can't break down fat and we can't use the carb stores. We can't use the fat stores. The body stores all that good stuff for use later, but when insulin is high, we can't get to it. And what do you think happens if you've stored stuff and you can't get to it? Well, of course it makes you hungry. Because if you can't get to it, you have to go find new food. And then you're being called slothful and a glutton because you can't control yourself when all along it is your hormones, your insulin that controls your behavior. So as you heard, Guyton had a lot to say about insulin and metabolism and fat storing and being overweight. But yet in Mayo Clinic, there is no mention of insulin as a cause in obesity. Not a word. Insulin in this article showed up twice in the section for complications because they're saying it's more like a side note that by the way, people with obesity are more likely to develop a number of different health problems such as heart disease and strokes. Obesity makes you more likely to have high blood pressure. Obesity can affect the way your body uses insulin. No, it's the carbohydrate that affects the insulin that causes the obesity. 
they get it backwards because they don't look at the cause and effect. And here's my favorite example about association versus cause and effect. So I'm sure you've all been driving along the road and all of a sudden it comes to a standstill. And if it's a really, really bad standstill that just goes on for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, now you're pretty much guaranteed that that traffic jam also is going to involve an accident and there's going to be some emergency vehicles once you get up there. This can be an ambulance and a fire truck and some police. But here's the curious thing. I've never actually seen how that started. I've never seen what was the first thing. But I think it's pretty clear. I think here's the way it starts. That first the emergency vehicle gets there. The police and the fire truck, they drive up and they park across the road. Because that's what I see whenever I come up there. And then that obviously causes the traffic jam and then traffic gets backed up for miles. And then, because they have nothing better to do, now the emergency responders take two cars and they smash them together into an accident. And I hope you know I'm kidding, but that's how crazy it gets when we confuse association with cause and effect. And when it comes to the law book, about how the body works, there is no confusion, there is no association, there is cause and effect. And it starts with increased carbohydrates that causes increased insulin, insulin spikes, which causes fat sparing, which means you can't get to your energy stores, which causes your body to prefer to go and look for new food which causes hunger, which makes you eat more, and then that insulin makes you burn less, and you're stuck in that loop as long as insulin is high. So knowing what the law book says, then we would expect the official guidelines that everyone agrees on to have food that does not stimulate insulin, right? That's what we would expect. So they tell us to eat fruit, plenty of fruit. Two cups of fruit gives you 69 grams of carb, 57 grams of sugar, so much fructose and glucose, etc. And I've used the imperial US units over here and the standard international units over there. I'm not going to read all these. Uh, you can go back and look at them. They want you to eat so much legumes and so much starchy vegetables and six ounces of whole grain and processed grain and they say at least half should be whole grain but as you can see there's very little difference in the sugar impact. They tell you to eat three cups of dairy and it should be low fat or non-fat and of course this dairy contains all the sugar but they take out this thing that could slow it down, the fat would reduce that insulin response a little bit. And then you can have up to 50 grams of added sugar to maintain a normal balanced lifestyle. So I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem like the recommendations I would expect knowing what we now know about insulin. So when we add it all up, we hear that they recommend 270 grams of carbs which includes 170 grams of sugar, 62 grams of those are fructose, which I'm not going to get into a lot in this video, but basically fructose has a low glycemic index, so it does not stimulate insulin, but it's worse because it is basically toxic to the liver. It works very much like alcohol on the liver, which promotes insulin resistance even more than any other carbohydrate. But all of the carbs that are not fructose are going to eventually turn into glucose and stimulate insulin. So we have 208 grams of things that either are glucose or going to become glucose. And I know what you're thinking. It can't be that bad right? Surely you're fudging the numbers. You're pushing them just a little bit to make a point. And I wish that was so. If you eat 270 grams of carbs on a 2000 calorie diet, that's 
and they recommend up to 65% of carbohydrates. So if we just use a number of 60, which is the typical recommendation, that would be 300 grams of carbohydrate. So now that we understand guitin and insulin a little bit better, it seems that not only are the official recommendations inappropriate, but they probably couldn't get worse if they try to make them bad on purpose. So if we visually illustrate the standard American diet and then we compare it to a diet that they use for lab rats to make them fat on purpose, then it seems like the obesogenic rat chow is not quite as bad as the standard American diet because the thing that causes insulin and fat storage is actually even higher in the standard American diet. So we started out saying that overweight people are usually considered guilty as charged, but now it seems like it's actually the guidelines that are guilty as charged because the guidelines fail on every point. When it comes to calories in, calories out, that's not how it works because it's about how the foods trigger different hormones, not about the number of calories, because the body does different things with the fuel based on which hormones and how much of those hormones are triggered. We also see that it's not about gluttony. It's not about poor character, because food becomes a drug. It's every bit as addictive as cocaine or heroin or anything else when we trigger powerful hormones that make us eat more. And it's not even about exercise. Even though I will never miss an opportunity to recommend exercise because there's nothing in the body that works the way it's supposed to without exercise, it's still not the way that you're gonna lose weight. It's still not the reason why overweight people stay overweight. It's because the insulin resistance prevents fat burning and it's because most of the insulin resistance is a result and associated with a fatty liver and we're not gonna pull fat out of the liver with exercise. And as if that wasn't enough, the ultimate fail is to assume that what works for one person is gonna work for another person. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say that, oh, but I do this and I'm not overweight. It's not what you're saying. Or someone says, oh, this is easy. I just stopped drinking soda and I lost 60 pounds. I don't know why these other people are failing. They must be lazy and have no character. But it's different that when you have stubborn weight, when you have become insulin resistant, when you either have a genetic predisposition or if you have broken down your tolerance over many, many years and you have stubborn weight, the rules have changed. They're completely different rules. The diet and lifestyle that's gonna maintain health for this person is not going to reverse the condition for that person. We just have to understand that it's different. So one person could eat 50 grams and that would be too much. And another person could eat 500 and they're totally fine, at least for many, many years. I probably ate a thousand grams of carbs and a lot of it was junk for a long, long time. But that was at that level of activity at that point in my life. It wasn't healthy. I had all sorts of other problems, but I didn't get overweight. I didn't become insulin resistant. I probably would have if I had kept it up. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.